Well, good morning. Good morning. It is good to see y'all here this morning as we come to worship the Lord. And uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Jenna Wilkes if she would come. All right. This is Jenna Wilkes. Her mom and dad are Josh and Angie Wilkes. And Jenna has asked Jesus into her life, and she is coming today to make her profession of faith public. And so we come today rejoicing with Jenna as she does that. So Jenna, in obedience to the commands of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If y'all noticed, Jenna didn't look at y'all whenever she was leaving. She said, I'm, I said, are you nervous? She said she was nervous. She says, I can get up in front of people, but I don't like it when they're looking at me. Or when she can, when, I'm sorry, when she could see them. So that's why she had it on out. Well, listen, we do rejoice, and I just want us to come before the Lord and thank him for his goodness and the fact that he is still in the business of saving people. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him for this time that we have. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we want to thank you for your goodness and your grace that you bestow upon us. Lord, I thank you for Jenna. Lord, the sweetheart that she has. Lord, the desire to follow you. And Lord, I just pray that you will just give her many, many years of service to you, that you will bless her life, and Lord, just make her a great witness for you in these days in which we live. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here at Marie Baptist. We pray that you will continue to bless. Lord, that you will help us to be faithful to what you have called us to do. And Lord, that in everything that we would always seek to glorify you. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. The psalmist said, And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen? Let's do our part today as we worship to fill the whole earth with the glory of God. Let's stand as we sing, O Worship the King.
Wow, church, welcome to church. I love our crowd this morning. Good to have everybody here. Uh, welcome to anybody that might be joining us online this morning. We're glad that you guys are with us as well. Um, it's amazing that we do have a living hope, that we have a hope that's alive in Jesus, that he's always been alive. He's always been in his place on his throne. And we were able to see just a, a, an example of that this morning with Jenna. Um, I know I've said this before, but it was an honor for us one night of camp just for Jenna to come to us and say, uh, I'm ready to pray. I'm ready to make Jesus my Lord. And it was just an honor for us to be there with her for that. Um, so I'm excited every time that we can start our service with a baptism. Let's see what we have for our announcements this morning. Okay, we've got a wedding shower for Abigail and for Josh next week. I'm sorry, two weeks, the 14th. That is from 4 to 5.30 in the fellowship hall. That's going to be a wedding shower. Uh, so make sure you get that on your calendar. Make sure you're able to be back here in a couple of weeks for their shower. Uh, Georgia Baptist Women are meeting uh, Tuesday the 9th at Miss Millie's house. So make sure if you have any questions about our Georgia Baptist Women or how to be a part of that, or maybe you've never been to one of the meetings before, uh, make sure you contact Miss Millie with questions about that. And our, yes, our children's programs will be restarting very soon with the new year. So you can see Amy if you have any questions about that. Uh, Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, Sunday nights, there's always going to be something for our... Um, our children fifth grade and younger. So make sure if you don't have your kids involved in that, that you will, that if you have any questions, please see Amy. Uh, and I know that she would love uh, to still get our, our children's ministry. They had a great summer, had things going on, and to just get it booming and get it started as the new year starts off. Uh, so make sure you see her if you need to know any of those dates or any of those times. Uh, our first Sunday, or first Sunday of each month, we have our breakfast. It's just a way for us to come together and fellowship. It starts before Sunday school, so next Sunday the 7th is extra special, not only because I hope we all come back for, for breakfast, uh, but also because next Sunday the 7th is our promotion Sunday. So that is all of our kids, the 5th grade and younger, that would be moving up to their next Sunday school class. Uh, they'll have the opportunity to meet their Sunday school teachers and to then go with them to class for the first time. Uh, also, all of our upcoming students, so all of our students that are coming up to 6th grade, uh, it'd be great to have them as well uh, at breakfast, and they'll follow the students straight into Sunday school. Uh, another announcement I do have about that is next Sunday the 7th. I know I've said this before, um, but we're going to have our student team meeting with our student team just to go over the schedule for the year and all of that. Uh, all of our upcoming parents, so our new 6th grade students, uh, for all of those parents, they're also welcome to come to that meeting at 4.30 next Sunday. That'll be a way for our new parents to meet the student team, and we'll go ahead and give them a schedule for the upcoming year as well. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, as far as the kids or students, see Amy or me, and we'll help you uh, get where you need to be with that. And uh, Kate and Brown has a baby shower this afternoon, 4.30 to 5.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Kate is registered to Amazon. And rumor is, Caden's husband will be making an appearance this afternoon. Um, the rumor is because Caden's husband was told by his wife to be making an appearance this afternoon. Uh, so you'll also see him there as well. That is today, this afternoon at 4.30. Okay, that is all for that. Um, I do want to just make this known again. A little lost and found statement from last week. Somebody did leave a gray jacket, and again, that could be for VBS, but that's back there at the Welcome Center. And so you can stop by the Welcome Center afterwards. If not, we'll kind of get it put out of the way. And you'll still be missing it in, you know, future weeks. So if you're still missing a gray jacket after this week, come find us. Uh, I also want to welcome any of our first-time guests that we have today. So if you will come see us at the Welcome Center right after service, if you'll fill out a little Connect card, let us know who you are, let us know uh, if we can give you any information, how we can serve you, and then we've got a gift that we'll give you as well. So make sure any of our guests for the first time, if you'll come see me at the Welcome Center. Okay, that's all of our announcements. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then we will dive right back into worship. So let's go to the Lord. Father, we love you, and we thank you. God, we are humbled, God, that we could be doing so many things, that even as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, God, you have saved us not because of anything we've done, but because you are so rich in mercy, because you are so rich in love, because you are so rich in grace. God, I love that we're able to see that example, that we're able to see that symbolism in Jenna this morning through baptism. God, there's nothing that any of us could ever do to earn your love, but you loved us enough that you died so that you could know us and so that we could know you. 
So God, I pray that as we continue into worship this morning, as we continue into, uh, God, reading your word and studying your truth a little bit later, God, as we're getting ready in the next couple of weeks to go all in onto a new church year, a new school year, God, let us really go all in. Let us really know that there's a father and that there's a creator that sees us, that has a purpose for us, that loves us. And God, all we have to do is step into that, and it's amazing what we'll see. God, we know that we don't deserve it. God, we know that we're unworthy. We know that we're not righteous. But God, we know that you give your worthiness and your righteousness to us. God, and we can only ever be grateful for that. So it's my prayer, God, that as we do go into worship, that the truth of who you are and who we are in you, God, comes out in our love of just singing to you. God, we love you. We ask these things in your powerful name. Amen. Blessed be the name.
be seated. Colton's coming to lead us in worship this morning. Pray for Colton as he comes. Carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let.
Well, Colton, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm going to say, everyone is gifted. Not all are gifted equally. Colton, look at me, buddy. You have a phenomenal gift with your voice. Always use it for the glory of God. Thank you so much for that. Um, our little ones... <laughs> Our little ones can be dismissed at this time as they're finding their way out. Um, if you have your Bibles, let me invite you to turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 and verse 46. Um, I'm going to ask a question that is probably going to be politically incorrect, but I've never known for being politically correct. How many of you, when you were younger... And I'm probably speaking about those of you who are probably at least 45 and above, maybe some who are a little bit younger. How many of you, when you were younger, you played cowboys and Indians, or Native Americans, excuse me? Okay, we got a few. All right, well, I've got a, a cousin of mine and, uh, and, two, and two brothers, and we stay pretty close. And we'll oftentimes kind of text each other a little, a meme. Y'all know what a meme is? A meme or whatever you call it? Um... It's not your grandmother. It's a little thing that says something, kind of a little quip or something like that. And uh, we are living in very different days. How many of you know that we live in very different days? It's different and, and not different in a good way. But I remember uh, my, my cousin, he sent this little thing and it said this. He said, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's a strange world when a child can no longer pretend to be an Indian but a grown man can pretend to be a woman. We live in some strange days. Something is happening in our world. Up is down, down is up. Black is white, and white is black. Forward is backward, and backward is forward. Right is wrong, and wrong is right. That seems to be the, 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 the way that we're living in this world today. Everything is completely messed up. In Genesis chapter 7, God destroyed the earth when it had moved beyond the point of redemption. People were so lost in their sin that God said, The end of all flesh is before me. And he sent the flood and wiped out everyone except Noah and his family. Church, the Lord's return appears to be soon and the day of destruction seems to be near. Certainly I would pray that the church would not slumber and sleep during these days of wickedness, but I would also pray that for those that are lost, they would realize that time is short and judgment is near, and there may not be many opportunities left for salvation. This morning I want to look at a man who was blind, and Jesus was passing his way, but it would be the final time that Jesus would pass his way. Jesus, as we come to Mark chapter 11 and verse 46, he is heading to Jerusalem to be crucified, and a blind man is in need of a miracle. If he does not respond now, he will never have another chance. The man's name is Bartimaeus, and we all know him as blind Bartimaeus. I want us to look at his story and how he came to faith in Jesus in a message that I've entitled, When Jesus Passes Your Way. If you have your Bibles, if you would please stand as we honor the reading of God. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through verse 52. And here is what Mark records. Now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately 
he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. You may be seated. <clears throat> so the Bible tells us that they came to Jericho, and as he is leaving out of Jericho, this incident occurs. Now, Jesus is about to make his ascent to Jerusalem. It is about a six-hour journey on foot. Jericho is about 15 miles to the northeast of Jerusalem. And I say that he is going to make his ascent even though he is going to be traveling south because Jerusalem is high up. Its elevation is higher than the surrounding area. And so Jesus will make an ascent. And so it's kind of an arduous journey as they travel up even though they're moving southward to go to Jerusalem. It's about a six-hour journey. It is 15 miles. And so, as we're looking at this, Jesus is in Jericho, and if you'll notice, the Bible said that there was a great multitude there with him. Jesus has had three years of ministry. He's been out preaching, he's been out teaching, he's been out healing, and his name has spread, and there is a messianic fervency that the Jews who are looking for the Messiah to come and, and relieve them from the Roman oppression, they many believe that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. But we know in very, very short time they will turn on him when he doesn't become the Messiah that they want. And so there is the messianic fervor. And many think that Jesus is the Messiah. The crowds have gathered as Jesus is on the final leg of his journey to Jerusalem and ultimately the cross. The crowd seems to be on a mission. Jesus is definitely on a mission. And then one man stops the entire processional. And I want us to look to see what happens here. Um, Two points and a couple of sub-points under each one. Here's the first thing that I want you to note here. It's what I call the sinner who cried for mercy. We see it here in verse 47. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now here's what's interesting. If you read the gospel account in Matthew, Matthew records that there were two men in this incident. But Matthew does not give a name. Only Mark records Mark only records one man and he gives his name. Now some people would look at that and say, "Oh, there's a contradiction there." It's not a contradiction. In fact, here's one thing that you need to understand. Um how many of you have heard of Lee Strobel's book or have seen the movie, The Case for Christ? Have any of you seen that? One of the things that is interesting about Lee Strobel in his coming to know Christ is that Lee Strobel was an atheist. And he was a, he was a journalist, I think it was for the Chicago Times. And, um, and he set out as a journalist to, to, uh, to disprove, actually is what he wanted to do, to disprove the resurrection of Christ. And it was interesting that as he began to look at the Gospels and he began to find out there were different accounts. And what he began to realize, and, and this is really kind of interesting and I had never thought about this, but he indicated there, I didn't read the book, I did watch the movie. That's always a little bit easier to do was to watch the movie rather than read the book. But one of the things that was interesting that he brings out is the fact that anytime you have eyewitnesses, what's going to happen if if 10 people see one event, they're all going to have a different perspective of what happened. And so when we look at the gospel accounts here, and we look to see what the gospel writers, you got to keep in mind that these are eyewitness accounts of what took place. Now when we read the gospel of Mark, Mark was not an eyewitness, but he was getting his information from someone who was an eyewitness, and that would have been Peter. Matthew, of course, was an eyewitness. But here's the interesting thing about it, and this was what was brought out whenever I was watching the movie, The Case for Christ, is that if you've got, if they're doing an investigation, and, and you've got four or five people who give an account, and every detail 
that each person gives is the exact same, that is actually less credible than if each one gives a little different account. And here's the reason. If everybody gives the same exact same account, the information has probably been corroborated. That they all got together and said, well, hey, here's the story that we're going to make up. And so when there are eyewitnesses, everyone sees things a little bit differently. And this actually lends to the credibility that we don't see everything exactly the same in all of the Gospels. And so what Matthew writes here is that there were two men. Mark only gives the account of one man. Does that mean that Mark is wrong? No, Mark is only focusing on one person. Why is it that Mark is only focusing on one person and he gives his name? Let me just tell you, this was a beggar man. And this beggar had nothing to offer to anyone. He was probably, for all accounts, unknown. Nobody knew who he was, and yet Mark records his name. Why does Mark record his name? Because the belief is this, that Bartimaeus... After Jesus healed him, the Bible says, and I'll point this out in a little bit, how he followed Jesus on the road. It is believed that Bartimaeus became a strong leader in the church and was a well-known follower. And by the time that Mark writes his gospel, everybody knows who Bartimaeus is and they know who his father is. And so they didn't really know who he was at the time and keep in mind Matthew was an eyewitness account he certainly didn't know who the guy was whenever he wrote his gospel but as Peter began to pass it on to Mark and Mark began to tell what happened his focus was simply on this one man and by this time it is believed that many in the church knew him personally and that is why Mark records his name and so here he is blind Bartimaeus the sinner who cried for mercy. Two things that I want you to note about him. Number one is this, is that his condition was serious. He was blind. And it left him at the mercy of those who would give him uh, homage. People who would give him these uh, money as a beggar. He needed he needed people to help him. And I want you to keep in mind that in this time in which we live, if nobody had given him any help, guess what would have happened to this poor man? He would have died this man would have starved to death if he did not have someone who would guide him along someone who would help him someone who would give him money or give him food this man was literally at the mercy of the world he was a beggar and hear this with absolutely nothing to offer he's along the roadside what is he doing along the road probably with all the other beggars waiting for people to come and to give money and by the way keep in mind that the feast of Passover is happening in Jerusalem so many would have been coming this way and their hope would have been that someone would have been merciful and given them money but he had nothing to offer there is not one thing that this man's presence does to help Jesus for all practical purposes this man is simply going to slow Jesus down. Now what is his infirmity? The Bible says that he is blind. In scripture, blindness is often used to describe spiritual ignorance or a person who is lost. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15 and verse 14. Jesus was describing the scribes and Pharisees and we know about the scribes and the Pharisees. They were religious leaders but they didn't know God, at least many of them didn't. There were some who were very sincere. We know of Nicodemus. We know of some who, like Nicodemus, was very sincere in his faith towards God, but many were, were hypocrites. And here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 14. In this encounter with the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus, speaking to his disciples, says, Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. And so scripture uses blindness in some ways as symbolic of lostness. Jesus said they were blind. They were not literally blind, but they were spiritually blind. They did not know the Lord. But as you begin to look at this man here, and we see the, the, the physical blindness that he experienced, there was also a spiritual blindness 
that he had. Those who were blind are spiritually ignorant. They are blind to the truth of God's word. In speaking, it speaks of being lost without salvation. The Pharisees did not know God, nor did they know his truth. Let me simply say this. Spiritual blindness is a serious condition. Why is that? The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And being a sinner, the Bible says this, the wages of sin is death. And so spiritual blindness is a very, very serious condition. When a person is spiritually blind, it leads that person to believe that they do not need God. When we are spiritually blind, not only do we fail to see the truth about God and who He is, we fail to see the truth about ourselves. We think we're actually pretty good when we're spiritually blind. It is amazing at the depth of depravity in our world, and yet people think they are okay. Absolutely amazing, all the stuff that is happening in the world today, all the craziness, and if you were to go on the street and ask the average person, do you think you're okay, they'll say, yes, I am okay. Why do they believe that? Because they are spiritually blind. So I want you to get this about Bartimaeus here. He was physically blind, and his condition was serious. We live in a world today where people are spiritually blind, and it is a very serious condition. But he was a sinner who cried out for mercy. His condition was serious, but I want you to notice a second thing about him. His time was limited. This man is not aware of Jesus' timeline. He's not been privy to the teaching of the disciples of what they were privy to. Remember what Jesus has already said to the disciples? Three times he's told them, we're heading to Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified. Well, they didn't quite get it. And so this man is not aware of all these things. But this would in fact be the last time that Jesus would pass this way. Because as Jesus is coming through Jericho, as he's leaving from Jericho, he's heading to Jerusalem to be crucified. So this is the last time he's coming. No doubt this man had heard about Jesus and all the miracles, and we shall see that. But he could not travel to get to Jesus. He needed Jesus to pass this way, and if he does not do anything, Jesus will not pass this way again. So here he is, blind Bartimaeus, sitting there on the road, and he begins to hear, there's the, there's the stirring of the crowd, and I'm sure that probably what he did was maybe somebody beside him, hey, what's happening? And somebody says, the man Jesus is here now do you get the picture here of salvation I want you to hear this Jesus is going to pass this way and it's the last opportunity for Bartimaeus Jesus is never going to pass this way again we live in a world where people keep putting their salvation off I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6. And here is what is spoken to the people. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found call upon him while he is near let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon does God abundantly pardon those who need mercy absolutely but what must happen we must call upon him when he can be found we must call upon him while he is near folks I'm telling you there is a day when God is not going to be near for people to call upon there is going to be a day when he is not going to be found when people seek him this man may not have thought in terms of this being his only chance but here's what he does when he knows it's Jesus he cries out he heard it was Jesus, 
He heard that Christ was coming, and what does he do? Notice what the Scripture tells us here. Verse 47, And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. What is this cry for mercy? The cry for mercy indicates that he understands that he is not worthy. You see, Jewish thought during this time, he would have been raised to believe that because he was blind, that it was sin in his life that caused his blindness. That's simply the way they view things. Anytime anything bad happens, it means it's because you're a sinner. And so here is this man, he's begging for mercy. He's not coming on the basis of his own merit, but he's coming on the basis of the mercy of the Lord. How many of you know that's how we come to salvation? It's not on how good we are. This man is crying out, have mercy on me. There is nothing that he has to offer. There is no merit of his own, and he's crying out to Jesus to have mercy on him. Now what happens? Get the picture here. As he's crying out, he cries out to Jesus, son of David, which is significant. We'll see that in a moment. And he says, have mercy on me. And what does, what does everybody start telling him to do? Shh, be quiet. You're, you're making too much noise here. People heard him and he was making a spectacle of himself. And it's interesting that as he is making a spectacle, and, and I want you all to, again, get the picture here, that this man, in the midst of this, this is kind of a, a chaotic scene. It's a large crowd. And if you can imagine a lot of noise and all the things that are going out, and, and he's saying, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Crying out louder than everyone else. Shh, man, be quiet. You're making a fool of yourself. Don't bother Jesus. He doesn't have time for you. Can I say this? When you get desperate enough, you don't care what other people think. And this man was desperate. Be quiet. And what does the Bible say that he did? He cried out even more. I'm too desperate. Here's a man that I believe can help me, and I don't care what the rest of you think. You can't do anything for me. He cried out the more. He calls him son of David, and that is, in fact, a messianic title that we see in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. This man, from everything that he had heard, from all the things that had gotten passed down to him, he recognized that Jesus, the son of David, was in fact the Messiah. Now, can I just say something here? Jesus is busy. He's got a lot on his mind. He's just told the disciples for the third time that he's going to be crucified, and how do they respond? <laughs> well, can I have first place? A lot is on his mind. He's, he's trying to teach the disciples and he's going to be leaving and they still don't get it. He's heading to Jerusalem. He's going to be crucified. Calvary is waiting and there's a lot of walking to do. And here's the question. Does Jesus have time for one person? Everyone is telling this guy to be quiet. We see the sinner who cried for mercy. Now I want you to notice the Savior who came for salvation. Look what the Bible says in verse 49. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. Why did Jesus come into this world? Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his purpose. To come and to seek and to save that which which was lost. Now, Jesus is on his mission to seek and to save that which was lost because he's heading to Calvary. And so here's what I find so interesting is that on his way to Calvary, Jesus heard the man's cry. This man cried out for salvation, and Jesus heard him. And I want you to notice, I have underlined this in my Bible, I never really paid much attention to this until I started studying this. And notice, the Bible says, So Jesus stood still. 
He heard this man cry for mercy. And Jesus stood still. Let that sink in. He's going to Calvary. He's being thronged by the people. The crowd is moving, perhaps a little chaotic. And in the midst of the chaos, the crowd, the noise, Jesus hears a lone cry of a man calling out for mercy. And when Jesus heard the cry for mercy, it stops him dead in his tracks. I want you to use your sanctified imagination here for just a moment. Now Jesus is heading out of Jericho. Whatever business he had in Jericho is done. He's leaving. And as he's going out, picture Jesus walking with the crowd, the excitement of the crowd, again the messianic fervor. What they've got on their mind is they're going to be relieved from the oppression of Rome. Jesus knows that's not what is about to happen. He has set his face toward Jerusalem and as the crowd is going and all of the chaos, Jesus hears this cry, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he stops and looks to see where this cry of mercy has come from. Get that picture. Church, Jesus will never, ever, ever Ignore a desperate cry for mercy. I don't care how busy he is. Here's a man that is crying out for mercy and it stops Jesus in his tracks. He came to give us mercy, to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus stood still. He stopped everything for this one single individual who cried out for mercy and then the Bible says and commanded him to be called then they called the blind man saying to him be of good cheer rise he is calling you why did they tell him to be of good cheer because when Jesus calls you it's a day to be excited here's a man that is being called by Christ hey come I want to see this man And the crowd that was telling him to be quiet, hey man, get up, he's calling you, you need to get over there. And so Jesus heard the man's cry. Now I want you to notice the second thing, Jesus healed the man's condition. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Now, it's interesting here. Jesus commanded the man to come. Now, this man doesn't come unless what? Unless Jesus calls. Church, I want you to hear this. You do not come on your own accord. The Bible says that that it's the Holy Spirit who draws us to himself. You don't just get to say, well, I think it's my time. You come when he calls. This man is being called by Jesus. He calls, and when you hear his voice, you better go. Now, what does this man do? The Bible says the man threw aside his garment. It's the only thing that he seems to have right now. And when Jesus is coming, listen, he's not worried about his garment. Jesus is calling. The Bible says that he threw his garment aside, and he came to Jesus. How incredibly sad had he just sat there. Can you imagine this, that if he's sitting there and he said, Hey, Jesus is saying, come, go to him. No, I think I'll stay here a minute. And what excuses could he have given? It's the same excuses that we see in the church today. When the Lord calls someone to salvation, Well, I'll wait. I'll wait till you come by next time and call me. Jesus, I don't, I don't know that I'm quite ready to come right now. I'll wait until next time. Or, or, or maybe... This excuse, he could have said, well, maybe I'll start seeing on my own. Maybe my, maybe my blindness will come back to me at some point, and Jesus, maybe I don't really need you. Or he could have said, there's another fellow that is helping people to see. I'll wait on him. Or he could have said, I'll wait till I'm on my deathbed, and maybe Jesus can come to me then. Folks, this man could have made all kinds of excuses 
as to why not to come to Christ. But he made none. Can I tell you that in the church today, when Christ calls, people make all kinds of excuses as to why not to come. Well, I'll wait until later. I'll wait until there's a more opportune time. Church, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. He threw away his garment and he came to Jesus because he was tired of being blind. This man was done with his old way of life where there was blindness. There was, he had to, to beg for people to do anything for him and now there is his hope in Christ that he can have, hear this, a brand new life. At what point do you get tired of your sin and cast off your garment and come to Jesus? This man, when Jesus called, he was ready. And I want you to notice what Jesus asked him. This is really interesting. In verse 51, Jesus said this, What do you want me to do for you? Does that sound vaguely familiar? If you look back, look back in... Um, verse 35 of this chapter then Jesus excuse me then James and John the sons of Zebedee came to him saying teacher we want you to do for us whatever we ask and Jesus asked them the exact same question what do you want me to do for you and what was their response <laughs> well, I want to sit on your left hand and I want to sit on your right hand it was all about them they were looking for what honor this man, when Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Rabboni, which means master. The fact that Jesus called him Rabboni is an indication that he was submitting himself to Christ by calling him master. And here's what he's saying. I want to be delivered from this darkness. The blindness that I have, I want you to touch me and deliver me. The man surrenders himself and Jesus heals him. Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. That word there, well, sozo, is the indication that not only was it a physical healing, but it was also a spiritual healing in his life that the man was saved. And immediately... He received his sight, and I love this, and followed Jesus on the road. He followed Jesus on the road. This should be the response to all who come to faith in the Lord. Again, we believe that he became a leader in the church. And it shows the sincerity that this man was not simply looking for a, a favor from Jesus and then he was going to go out and do his own life. Here's a man that says, Jesus, take it. Heal me. Deliver me. But he calls him Rabboni and from that moment on, it appears that he followed him all the days of his life. Church, I'm going to conclude with this. We are living in a day when people's hearts are becoming hardened to the gospel. We're watching well-known preachers turn from the faith as they do what we call a deconstruction of their faith. The days are evil and the time is short. What will you do when Jesus passes your way? It is to your own destruction if you ignore him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, I want to thank you for your blessings. I thank you, Lord for your saving grace. And Lord, as we see this, this story of blind Bartimaeus and how he cried out for mercy and in his crying out for mercy, you saved him. I would pray, Lord, that there is a person here today that they realize the, the darkness, Lord, that they are walking in, their lostness. I would pray, Heavenly Father, that you would call them and, Lord, they would not just sit idly by I pray, Lord, that they will surrender all to you. Lord, the days are getting more and more wicked. The time is short. And today is the day of salvation. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you will draw as only you can. And if there is a lost person in this room,
convict them, Lord, of their sin and draw them to yourself. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. I don't typically do this. Y'all know that I'm one who will sing a couple of verses and I usually don't intercede and say anything. But church, I really do believe that we are living in a day where it's going to get harder and harder and harder. We're seeing it in the church. People who profess to be believers that are turning away from the gospel. We're watching our younger generation as fewer and fewer have any belief in God at all. We are not living in a time where more and more people are getting saved. We are living in a time where more and more people are turning their faith away from God. I'm, I'm just going to say this for any person that is here and you feel the Lord is speaking to you, and you're sitting there, you're what we call white-knuckling the pew, you're hanging on and saying, well, if I can, maybe later. There may not be a later. This man did not have any assurance whatsoever that Jesus would ever pass that way again, and in fact, Christ never passed that way again. You don't have the assurance in your life that Jesus is going to pass your way again. You may walk out these doors and you could literally get into a car accident, something can happen, and you could spend a Christless eternity in hell. Those of you who know me, you know that I am not a manipulator. I don't get up here and try to, try to get people all emotional and get their emotions all going. That is not the kind of preacher I am. I believe that truly a person only comes to Christ through the drawing power of the Holy Spirit. But I will beckon you that if the Lord is speaking to your heart, if there's any questions that you have, stop resisting Him. Today could be your last day. So we're going to sing again. And this is your verse. If the Lord is speaking to your heart, I truly believe that the days are growing short. And I believe that I would be shirking my responsibility as a pastor if I did not share with you the need of the hour and how desperate the situation is. So if the Lord is speaking to your heart, would you come and surrender to Him today? Thank you all. Be seated. I will say before we exit out, if there are any of you who need to talk to someone, please call me. I would love to talk to you and share more with you 
but it's imperative. If you don't know Jesus, then what the scripture says is that you will spend a Christless eternity in hell. But Jesus came to do what? To seek and save that which was lost. I want to make mention very quickly here. Um, a, a few months ago, I don't know exactly how many, Brother Robert Rogers had come and shared with us that we were going to be starting um, a, a, an organized outreach here at the church. And a number of you signed up for that. How many of you remember those little cards that you filled out? Okay. All right. If you filled out one of those cards, we are going to be meeting on August the 8th at 7 o'clock here in the fellowship hall. And uh, you'll be getting a phone call or at least a text message or a contact just to remind you if you forgot that you filled out one of those cards. We're going to remind you that you did. And we're going to have a, uh, an organized outreach. We're going to set up the teams and we're going to get all of that going. And for all of our outreach leaders, um, they've been contacted. We've got a meeting on August the Tuesday. What is Tuesday? The 2nd. August the 2nd. And uh, we're going to be up here. And uh, Now we're not going to feed the big crowd. That's too many. We're going to feed the small crowd that comes on, uh, on August the 2nd. So all of our outreach leaders there who are going to be outreach leaders, they know who they are. You can come, bring your spouse. If you have children, bring your children. We're going to come and we're going to eat. But we're going to get this thing together and uh, we're going to have a great outreach here at Marie Baptist Church. But I just simply wanted to remind all of you about that. Again, August the 2nd for all of the outreach leaders and August the 8th next Monday for everyone who has signed up to be a part of our outreach. And thank you all for doing that. If you didn't sign up and you want to come, sign up. We'll get you on a team so that you can help. Jacob. All right, commit cards are still out there. If you want to participate, you can fill one out as you are, as you're exiting. Listen, thank you all so much for being here today. I pray that God will bless you. And know we serve a good God who's in control of everything. And church, he's still in the saving business. And we have a responsibility to go and share the gospel. So let's go out and make sure that we are a faithful witness for our Lord Jesus so that we can see many people ushered into his kingdom and that he will be glorified through that. Thank you all very much. You all have a wonderful day.